um, digital disruption. And hello, everybody standing out there right now. Come inside. We have room. We have, we have some free seats on this side, free seats on this side. Just come right through the middle and uh, enjoy the next part of our presentation. So digital disruption, how the next evolutionary stage of the internet changes markets, markets and companies. And we asked one of the most respected digital uh, experts, um, or let's put it this way, experts in digital economics, to come up with some insights, some inspiring ideas. This is exactly what he did, and he's here now to share it with us. So please give a big round of, of, of applause to the author of Digital Disruption. Here is Dr. Jens Uwe Meyer. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking a lot about digital transformation right now. But I want to take it one step further. Very often, we don't just talk about digital transformation, but we talk about new industries coming up, a break up with traditional industry thinking. And this is what I'm going to talk about in my presentation. In the old times, if you wanted to do innovation, it was kind of easy because you just said, come on, ask your customers. This is the way we did innovation. We looked at customers and asked them, what new features do you want? Which kind of innovation would you prefer? But the problem with digital innovation is that we have the so-called chicken egg dilemma. What does it mean, the chicken egg dilemma? Just now a question, uh, just, just to the man, please. Who of you needed a navigation system before it was invented? Come on. We are men. We don't even ask, right? So the, the, the navigation system is a typical invention that has been done without the consumer demand because it was given to us. And then we looked for the technology. We said, wow, wow, that's great. And this is how digital disruption happens. It's not that your customers will necessarily tell you what to invent and what to do. It's about technology that drives innovation. And customers detect these innovations. They look at the technology. They play around. And then they detect, wow, it's great. And what else do we see? We see that technology is changing human behavior. Give you an example. Can you still remember your life before WhatsApp, before SMS? Come on, if you, you know, I took a plane yesterday from Munich to Hanover. As soon as the plane landed, everyone looked like, yes, honey, I'm still alive. They're like, come on, you were just flying from Munich to Hanover, nothing happened. You know how the old days were? My father used to be in Africa, normally for three weeks, visiting dealers of BMW. What did we do? So he went away, we said goodbye. In the evening, we watched the news, and if there was no plane crash reported from Africa, we knew that he was still alive. So there was basically no customer demand for WhatsApp, SMS, short messaging services. But as soon as people detect, oh, wow, that's great. I can do fantastic things with this new technology, they will accept it and then they will demand it. But of course, it's not that easy because normally when we see innovation, we're skeptical. We look at it and like, ah, we look at the dangers of the technology. And this is a very old and traditional thinking. I just want to show it to you in a small video I, I brought to you. Just have a look at this. Thank you for your time and welcome to our focus group. Today we're going to show you an idea and ask for your opinion. This is called a wheel. Now, according to its developers, it'll change the way we work and live. Why? because it rolls. It can also be added to wagons to make moving a heavy load easier. Your opinions. It, if it rolls, that means it could roll away and get lost, right? Or it could roll over your foot. It's the round shape that disturbs me. It's, it's very feminine. <gasps> mm. I can't imagine any caveman wanting to be seen with that. No, I wouldn't. And this added to wagons thing, it sounds very 
complicated. Is there an easier version? Do you know what? Do... Do you have it in, um... Square? No square. If... <laughs> if... If there was a, a square one... Yeah? It didn't roll... I would think about buying one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is this is exactly how we are. We look at a new idea and we're skeptical. We're afraid. We we think about all the dangers. In fact, as human beings, we all behave a little bit like penguins. Please imagine for a second you and I we're all penguins, not human beings. So as penguins, we would have a great life. Why? As long as we're here on the ice shell, we're safe. Basically, no danger for our life. But here's, here's the water. And this is kind of dangerous because there are sharks, there are whales, the orcas, and they want to catch you or you or you as a snack. So when penguins go hunting, they have a wonderful behavior. What do they do? They all go to the edge of the ice. Here, here's the water, here's the ice. And you know what they do? Nothing. They wait. Approximately 10,000, 20,000 penguins standing and waiting. You know, they're waiting for the first idiot to jump in. Then they have a look. Okay, still alive, still alive. Okay, let's jump. This is our old behavior when it comes to innovation. We first said, okay, let our competitors do it. Then let's see what's happened, happening. And after that, we do it. You know, there is, there's even... Uh, management language like benchmarking, which is exactly behaving like penguins, or fast follower strategy. By the way, I'm still waiting for my son. He's now in sixth grade. I'm waiting for him to come home. And I said, what did you do? You looked during the exam at your neighbor and took over everything. And he would say, nope, fast follower yeah, strategy. It's benchmarking in school. I'm still waiting for this. Why do I tell you this? Because this is kind of the old and traditional way of thinking. But this old and traditional way of thinking, ask your customer, wait for someone else to be the first, be the fast follower, wait, no risk. These times are over because we live in a stage of digital disruption. We live in the age of digital disruption, which means that basically every industry will be disrupted within the next couple of years. Let me give you some examples. For example, a peat miner. You know what a peat miner is? Somebody who's, who's basically playing with dirt all the time. So a peat miner, I guess most of you would say, well, come on, can you digitize dirt? Nah. This guy will never be affected by digitalization. This is a very traditional branch, you know. The peat, meaning the dirt, will be produced, it's a very clean dirt, and then it will come into greenhouses. Why? Because it gives safety and security to the young crops. This is basically the use case of, uh, of, of the dirt. But now technology comes into place because no one actually wants this stuff. You know, peat, is, it's ugly, it's dirty, it makes a lot of work. So of course, operating a greenhouse means are there alternatives to, to, to peat? And yes, there are. Look at, that's the small version. Look at what is happening here. What is happening here is that um, we have small greenhouses and they have sensors. And sensors say, hello, please, some more fertilizer here. Change the light. So in a way, algorithms will take over the job of the peat miner. This is digital disruption. It's not just to be more effective. It's rethinking the business logic. We see this in different markets. For example, the fitness market, famous German company, Kettler. Kettler um, had some problems two years ago. They went into bankruptcy and now they're still alive. The problem is not that their machines are bad. It's not. It's the problem that the market has changed. That just within six or seven years, customer behavior change drastically. 
Today, it's fine to have great quality, you know, because these products are really good. It's a rowing machine. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's great. It's easy, sustainable. But the problem is that the market has changed. This is how sports looks today. If your machine is not able to talk to your smartphone, if it's not able to analyze your behavior, if it's not your personal coach, it's tough to sell it. And it will be even tougher in the future because People who do sports, we just conducted a study on the sports market, digitalization in the sports industry. People who do sports really demand analyzing their data. So if the machine is not able to connect to your smartphone, that means within five to eight years, your product is out of range and customers will not buy it anymore. What we see, of course, is the financial industry a lot. I mean, you heard Last year, the Commerzbank in Germany is saying we're going to cut off 20% of the jobs because we're going to become a technology company. If you're not living in a large city, but you're living in the landscape, you will notice that the traditional banking branches close, that uh, services are going to be cut down. And why does this happen? Because if you really have a look into the financial industry, you as a customer, I'm not, not just now talking about you as a business customer, just as a private customer. What do you do in the bank? Number one, you go there to get money from the ATM machine. Actually, most people don't really recognize today that there are human beings working behind the ATM station. Yes, there are people who work in a bank. So number one is I want to get cash. Number two is if I want to invest money, somebody has to consult me. So now look at the trends we have with money. How long will cash still be around? And if there's cash, you know, if you, if you don't have the need for cash, why is there a reason to visit a banking branch? Now you can say, yes, because of the financial consulting, yes, but robo, so-called so robo-advisors, are taking over these jobs. Robo-advisors, it's one of the fastest growing markets in the industry. That means algorithms decide about your financial strategies. And it's very interesting to see how disruption happens. Something that is really important to tell you is that if you go home today, you will not feel disruption. If you still operate in the old-fashioned mode, within one year, nothing will happen. One of the pictures I will show you, one of the, the business graphs today I will show you is uh, the, the debt of the Newsweek. Newsweek in the past, one of the traditional US magazines, one of the great magazines in journalism, it died a couple of years ago. Now they're trying to, to revitalize it a little bit, but it's not like in the old times. So the question, of course, was why Newsweek? And you might think, well, it's an American magazine. We all know about fake news. We all you know, heard about this. So what, is, what was happening here? Maybe they just ignored the internet. Maybe Donald Trump is right. It's fake news. They never reported about the internet. They ignored it. But you know, something interesting happened. They were the first, actually, to report about this trend. I was living in the United States in Washington, DC, as a US correspondent for the Voice of America in 1993, and we were kind of shocked by this Newsweek cover. We were like, huh, a new technology will change everything. So that's a cover, I mean, this is 25 years ago. This is really old, this is antique. But now what happened to Newsweek? If they were the first ones to realize, why didn't they act? And now something comes, this is how disruption feels like. They were talking about it, but they never felt it. Look at their circulation. 1992, more than 300,000. At that time, everyone thought, oh my God, newspaper is that. Newspaper is that. Oh my God, oh my God. Nothing happened. 1995, three years after it, nothing happened. 1998, internet goes up. You know, first kind of, that was the first upcoming of the internet business models. Nothing happened to Newsweek. So at this time, they felt safe, and they thought, like, nothing will happen to our business model. Again, 2001, most of you remember what happened. Stock markets crashed. The German Neue Markt crashed down and was wiped away. So everyone thought, this Internet is overrated. You know, it's, it's people exaggerated. Nothing will happen. Well, 
This still went on until the year 2008. But here, something happened. This is how digital disruption feels like. We had two effects coming together. Number one, Newsweek was making so much money that they could really ignore the internet. It just didn't care. Why? As long as you sell newspapers and advertising companies come to you and spend their money, there's no reason to act. But in 2008, what was 2008, 2008? Lehman Brothers, right. What happened? People were shifting their advertisement budgets. Everything went down. And the decision was, we're now giving away our advertisement budgets into the internet. And this is something that you can, can see for a long time. You can ignore the need for digital disruption. You can really ignore the need to rethink your business model. And it works until something happened. What uh, late questions later on. So we see the same thing happening in the banking industry. For the last couple of years, I mean, until you, you know, if you really make money as a bank, because you say, you know what, we're making so much money with the interest rates, it's great, you know, we can borrow money, we get it back, wow, wonderful. It doesn't matter if you have still an analog business model and if your structure is much too, ex it's really expensive, it just doesn't matter. But what is happening right now? No interest rates, no money, business model for the banks uh, is, is a problem. You might see, by the way, the same thing in the German housing industry within the next three or four years. Because right now, if you build a house in Germany, in Stuttgart, for example, or Hanover, you know, you can build a shoebox and you can sell it for 200,000 euros. It doesn't matter. Everyone will buy it. So, of course, we have a lot of companies and a lot of inefficiency in the market. But hey, who cares? You're making money. You're inefficient, doesn't matter. Your people, you know, your customers might want new services. You don't care because you make a lot of money. But now, what is happening if interest rates go up again, if the market comes down? So it might be good to invest now in the digitalization of, the, of this industry because you might think that in four or five years, the same might happen that happened to Newsweek. Something very important that is happening as well Customers change and this is important. You know, I talk a lot to salespeople and in the old times they said Wow, you know, it was great. I called the customer and uh, We set up a meeting and they bought Forget about it. Many salespeople today tell you customers change. We all change The digital customers are special and that's the reason why markets are disrupted. You know, I was a programming director on, uh, of a radio station, MDR Jump, Mitteldeutscher Rundfunk, was a huge radio station, or is still a huge radio station for young people. Are young people still listening to radio? No, 30% are not. Why? Because they're so much used to Spotify and Apple Music, they just don't care about the medium radio as it is. So. Technology is changing us, it's changing me, it's changing you, it's changing your customers. Number one, and this is very important, customers are impatient. Just have a look at yourself. You're going to register at some internet service. The moment you register, you look for the mail to activate your account. If the mail doesn't come, Within three seconds, you're like, come on, what kind of service is this? In the old times, German word, Antragsformular. You know, you had to fill out a form. You had to apply for a membership. That was the old times. But just imagine today, a digital customer goes to the doctor and is like, wow, you, you tell me a diagnosis, why is it not on my smartphone? A digital customer is uh, trying to get an appointment with one of your sales representatives. And the digital customers tell you, well, why do I have to call you? Why, why is it not possible to, 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 to get uh, the, 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 the date of our meeting to have it on, the, on, on, on my smartphone? Digital customers are very impatient. And this is something that is happening to us. Just have a look at yourself. You expect everything to happen right now. And if your car breaks down, you have this red lamp. You're like, oh my God, the red lamp in my car. In the old times, you were like, no problem. Just, I drive to the right, I stop. And then you were looking into 
Do, do you still know that your car has something like a Betriebsanleitung? Yes, it's here, you know, you, you can have a look at it. And then you were looking at the lamp and you were saying, ah, oh, what is it? Today, impossible. A lamp is coming up, you want the diagnosis, you want the, the, the solution, you want it right now. And this is how digital customers are. This is something that we have to get adapted to. This is the reason why many lawyers are out of job, because people, of course, you know, when the lawyer is playing golf in the evening at 5 p.m., then the customer says, I have a problem. And the customer doesn't want to see a lawyer. A customer wants a solution. And if the customer gets the solution on the internet, he will ignore the lawyer. He says, okay, you play golf, I use an internet service for the same thing. This is how customers are. What else are they? They are unfaithful. That means they are not loyal anymore. Loyalty goes down drastically. Why? Let me tell you a little bit about my first job I had in my life. I'm a, I was trained to be a criminal inspector in Germany, in Hamburg. And one of the stations uh, I was assigned to was the Hamburg Reeperbahn, Davidwache. And uh, if you're not familiar with the, let's call it the special part of the service industry in Hamburg at the Hamburg Reeperbahn, maybe somebody from Germany might explain it to you later. So what we experienced nearly every night is that there were men coming and saying, well, I had some minor problems. I did something I didn't want to do. And so we asked them, these people, normally we said, okay, no problem. Um, they were betrayed, something like this happened. So we normally said, okay, no problem. We're going to write an official letter to your private address. Normally, if, if they were married, they were gone immediately. No letter to me. So this is what happening. But why did this man on Ripperbahn become unfaithful? Very simple because it's just around you. It's overwhelming, it's the same in the Amsterdam red light district. It's overwhelming for them. You know, at the first one, they said, no, I don't want to do it. Second one, no. After number 10 or 20, they're like, I'm an idiot if I don't try it. And so the same thing happens, of course, on the internet. You get offers everywhere. You cannot really move on the internet. You cannot even surf on the internet without getting annoyed by try this, try this, try this. And of course, this is where your customers get lost. Because customers are not faithful anymore. And if you don't keep them, if you don't offer them something all the time, build up a digital relationship, they're gone. And of course, they're linked up. What does this mean? Customers know everything. They know who to ask. They are informed. Something that always happens is that one of your sales representatives might come and see a customer and you know what? The customer is better informed than your sales representative because he has seen all the videos, he has seen everything, he talked to other customers, he knows about the experience and wow, this is the reason why customers are different. So, we're dealing with a new species of customers in these digital business models. What does it mean for you? Something that is very important, digital disruption doesn't mean that you have to change everything overnight. Please don't do it. I think you all have a running business, it's running great. A running uh, production facility, a running uh, company, a running service business. Please don't stop it. But you might run into a trap because if you just keep on optimizing the old business model, if you own a shop for shoes somewhere in Hanover in the city and you just keep on optimizing this old business model, then suddenly you might forget that there are digital customers around them and that there are other digital companies hunting for exactly these customers. And the same customers that buy your shoes will tomorrow buy personalized shoes from a digital manufacturer. So things are changing. What you have to do, it sounds a little bit crazy. On the one hand, you know, the left hand or the left side of your brain has to do everything to protect the current business. Everything. Protect it. Grow it. Attack your competitors. Everything you do to keep the old traditional cow alive. You know, until the cow gives milk, you know, get the milk from the cow. 
On the other hand, and this is maybe day number five in your weekly schedule, do everything to attack your current business. We call this a reset technology. Reset your thinking. Try to think you would invent your business today. Would you still invent it the same way? Would you still believe that if you invest five years of business development in your new business in the same branch, it will still be successful in five years in the way it's now? So try to think as the defender and the attacker at the same time. And this is important. Second thing that is very important, we love security. This is why we're in business. Business loves security. This is why we're doing market research, you know. I've seen so many really, let's, I always call it bullshit market research. This is just some, these are just some pills for managers in decision processes. They sometimes ask really stupid questions. I, I remember we, we, we're working together with one huge chain, gas stations, and they were developing a new sandwich. What would you normally do in, if you would develop a new sandwich? I think normally what you would do, you would just go prepare a sandwich, give it out to a customer and say, hey, try it. But if you think like this, then you would have to accept that you might fail because your customer might not like the sandwich. So they did a huge market research. And now I'm telling you the 50,000 euro recipe because this was the knowledge I share with you now is worth 50,000 euros. So if you, this is what, how much they paid for the market research. If you want to provide a sandwich to customers at a gas station, number one, it has to be, I see everyone like, yes, tell me the magic secret, yes. Fresh, great, came out of market research. I was like, really, I thought that people really like old bread, but okay, it's fresh. Number two, it has to be tasty, great, you're like, Wow. And number three, big, big surprise. People want to eat the sandwich while they are driving. You're like, yes, otherwise I would not buy it at a gas station. So you see, very often we try to get certainty. We try to get security from market research and analysis. But now it's important to act. To act and to try out new things. This basically means that you have to learn to fail. I really write learning to fail because we learn a lot. Think about your school career. Did you learn to fail? No, failing was always bad. If, for example, you had just a, a C grade instead of an A grade or just a grade which is a vier minus instead of eins, you were bad. Failing was always considered to be bad. That means nev you, you never learned that failing in a way is a great thing. Yeah, I had one CEO, the CEO of uh, Thomas Cook. He asked his management, do we have a graveyard of failed innovations? Because just if we have the graveyard, we know where we tried something and we were just too early for our customers. So think about a new way to fail, learning to fail and trying to learn out of the mistakes that you make as an organization. But I think the most important message, and this is something, you know, I, I told you a little bit about my career. It was. Uh, policeman, criminal inspector in Hamburg. I was a programming director at a radio station. In between, I was working for German television for um, Pro7. And one of the nicest stories I ever did, I followed the team of Thrust SSC in the Nevada desert. And uh, what did they do? Let, let's have a look at the small video here I brought to you. This is the Black Rock Desert. And what is happening here in 1997, is that the team of Thrust SSC, they were trying to break the land speed record. Just a second, listen, listen, listen for a second. That was it. That was it. Couple of years training for that one moment, that was it. Huge innovation, they had two engines, uh, Rolls-Royce engines from a Boeing 737 installed with a car. So they used it. So it's, it was great, set success. But the, 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 the interesting part was the neighbor. And the neighbor was Greg Breedlove. Greg Breedlove, poor guy, he was just able to afford one engine because Rolls-Royce engines are quite expensive. So this guy was not able to run 750 miles per hour, just 450. 
And, but instead of giving up, I mean, normally you would say, come on, get a good job, apply at Siemens, do something. No, Greg Breedlove was standing there and he said, I try again. And instead of giving up, he was working on the next step, on an innovation in order to reach 460 miles per hour, not just 450. And, you know, as a young reporter, I, I asked him, Mr. Breedlove, I mean, why do you still do this? I mean, why, why don't you give up? I mean, why do you still try this? And he gave me a very important lesson. I think it's one of the lessons that you can just learn in the desert of Nevada. He said, well... I think it just gives me a kick. And I think this is my message to you. Please, if you look at digital disruption, one thing that is very important, ladies and gentlemen, have fun and do it. Thank you very much. You will get some of my books, small booklets. I think they are out here. Um, ah, thank you very much. Thanks. Here we go. Dr. Jensen.